Hey everybody, uh, welcome to a very special fireside chat we have with a very special uh, f guest and friend of the friend of the firm, Sarah Guo, who's been a, a, a partner at Greylock uh, for, have you been there for five years, six years? Six years now. And yeah. uh, focuses on the uh, enterprise space broadly. Um, and uh, is a great friend to Village and we are excited uh, to have her here. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, this year will be the year where we do our first co-investment uh, together. Uh, and um, we're excited to talk a, lo a lot about um, things from the investor perspective, things from the founder perspective. And so I want to let you briefly uh, introduce what it is that is your focus uh, at Greylock um, in terms of what is the, the range of things you look at and look to, look to invest in. How, how do you divide up the world? Okay, cool. So, um, so there are seven of us uh, GPs at Greylock, um, and so we broadly do like B2B and B2C software driven things. Um, within that, the philosophy at Greylock is really like you should have like um, uh, just certain core areas of interest and things you understand more deeply. But people also like we're we're not arrogant enough to think that we have all the best ideas. So we are just open to whatever entrepreneurs come up with. Um, like my background was in like networking infrastructure. I have no investments in networking infrastructure actually. Um, so because you couldn't find any, or because the, the firm has three investments in networking, um, and I think that those are like three of the maybe five interesting plays yeah. out there. Um, they just happen to not be mine, and I didn't want to spend any more time competing with like Cisco and stuff. And there's yeah. a lot of interesting um, software to be built out there. So uh, I personally spend a lot of time on just like broadly SaaS, and I can talk about certain areas, like I, I think like AI native companies, companies that are taking advantage of some like um, sort of tangential innovation. So think like there's a lot happening in the FinTech uh, ecosystem, right? And if you can take advantage of some of that uh, innovation and bring it into like the enterprise space, say in B2P payments or finance, like I think that's really interesting. Um, I think there are a lot more companies in the enterprise with network effects than yeah. there used to be. So like we're looking for people with new economic models or like building ecosystems. Um, because I was a networking person, like I do really like security. Uh, I think like it's a really interesting mission. It's yeah more relevant than ever um, uh, and like I just like that community and have a, a couple boards of security companies um, and then stuff to uh, stuff that serves like technical audiences so um, uh, developers uh, and, and anybody like making more software yeah um, just because like if you believe in the overall rise of software it's a really interesting segment but that being said like pretty broad. I think um, there's a lot also just I if you look at your average medium sized or large sized company, um, there are people still doing like crazy paper based yeah. manual processes. Like that's not how we should be doing work uh, mm -hmm. in 2019. Right. And so I think just like up leveling all of that to um, like modern, mobile, digital, more automated stuff is really interesting to me. Cool. So let's go through those four segments actually. And let's start with why are there more enterprise businesses with network effects today? And what does that look like practically? Um, so I, I think some of it is just entrepreneurs getting more creative, mm. right? So I don't, I don't know that there are like necessarily, um, not all of it is driven by sort of secular trends. Some of it is, right? And so like your ability to have network effects if you're an on-prem enterprise software business with like a different implementation in all of your hundreds of thousands of customers, yeah. like you're, you're, you're gonna struggle to do anything because you don't own, you don't hold the data, you know very little about how your customers use your software and there's no like online connectivity really. Um, uh, but so I think one, one reason you have companies with network effects is like they're SaaS companies. Yeah. So like they're in the cloud, they have a lot more data um, from their customers. Sometimes they have permission to use part of that data to do something good for the entire community. Um, I think like people in the enterprise now think more about community and like transactions yeah. between their customers and I think that's really interesting. Um, and a, another like obvious example in, in our portfolio, another big uh, supporter of Village is like, if you look at um, Reid Hoffman's company, um, LinkedIn, like, you know, your, your, your life as an individual and as an employee is like not two circles, right? It's a Venn diagram and so um, I, I think some of the concepts that apply for our, like network effects in consumer land also yeah. apply to the enterprise. So we have a you know, bunch of uh, SaaS companies in this cohort. You, you've, you guys have invested in a bunch. What common advice do you find yourself giving as it regards to building and leveraging network effects or, or community on, on those companies? Yeah, um, so I'd say like that's a, 
that's like a pretty deep strategic yeah. question. I think the best advice that like I can really give the companies I work with is like go go look for them and here are some of the best, most interesting examples in different modes of where people have actually gone to real network effects. Yeah. Like, you know, like maybe you should go talk to the people at Okta about building an ecosystem or the people at LinkedIn about like using consumer data yeah. um, and like how to think about privacy and all of those things because like all of these, these are not things, like you can't add on a network effect to your company like as it, it's a core part of the product, yeah, right? Totally. Uh, let's talk about payments. Yeah. Where in B2B payments are you most excited? What, what does yeah, that look like? Yeah, so I, I mean, it, it, this is kind of connected to the, to the last thing I said I was interested in, which is um, uh, like, I think just like everybody prefers the experience of like Venmo to pay their friends versus um, like writing a check or something. Like if you could, you'd, you'd Venmo your landlord, right? You wouldn't like go through whatever experience you go through today. Um, like in the enterprise, it's all your landlord. You know, like there's there's a ton of this like terrible process internally of like emailing somebody and then like maybe you have an online system that like basically writes a check or does a wire transfer somewhere. Um, but we've seen a ton of innovation around the like area of well, like financial systems, there are networks that you can increasingly access in digital ways in terms of like the data through something like Plaid or like actually, you know, moving money around, right? With virtual cards or like creating actual networks between different companies. Um, and I think like we're just at the very beginning of that because everybody does things in a super antiquated way today. Are there any examples of companies you've invested in or, or, or seen that are this and yeah, I hope to be making an investment in this area, and I've got a couple things I'm tracking like this year. Um, a company you guys have all heard of that's like doing a very specific thing in the market is Brex, right? Um, like, why should it be so painful to issue virtual charge cards? I think the question with something like Brex is like, hey, that's it's actually pretty easy, right? Because you're you're getting infrastructure from the fintech ecosystem. Uh, and so I think we're going to see a lot more plays that look like this. Right. And what did Brex really figure out? Like, why hadn't it, hadn't it done before? Or what was their sort of key, in, key insight that allowed them to scale so quickly? Yeah, I, I would say I am not a, an investor, so I yeah. can only look at it from the outside. Um, there's an interesting podcast about outdoor advertising from Brex. And so I'd say, like, you know, I think they were, uh, I, I'm serious. It's like, it, it's, it's quite interesting. It's from um, uh, the CEO and the CRO. And I, I'd say, like, there are things that they did on the product innovation side, which is they, they saw the opportunity to use virtual credit cards for startups more than before other people did. Though I think a lot of people see different ways you can use like FinTech innovation now, um, but they also were like very aggressive and possibly creative on the sort of go-to-market side too with yeah. startups. Let's talk about security uh, and privacy and, and talk about where you're excited there and, and also how that has evolved in the you know, five plus years you, you've been at Greylock? Yeah, um, so I think people, like f five years ago, if you said you're interested in like security and privacy, like people would be like, oh, that's like weird and gross actually. Um, or like people outside of a, a certain community, right? Even engineers would be like, oh, like I don't care about that. And I think that's true um, to a much smaller degree today, just because like consumers are forcing companies to care. Um, uh, and, and so uh, I just think like it's actually not a really difficult trend to um, understand if you believe like if you believe in basically like more internet like yeah. we're gonna do more important things and have more data on the internet um, then like the security problem is never gonna go away right because people want access to and the privacy problem access to and um, the ability to manipulate that data or whatever systems you have um, so the industry is like the security industry, not including privacy, which is like kind of a different issue, um, is just doubling over the next five years. So it's growing really fast. And I think like then there are even beyond the uh, the drivers of people being like, oh, we actually care about our data, our IP, our reputation much more than we used to. And like we have all of these systems online. Uh, um, uh, you have like all of these other sort of infrastructure and business trends that change how people have to do security, right? So security in a world that was just like your single data center as a big business is super different than like, yeah. oh, I have like AWS and GCP um, and all these other very different issues right. around how I build my applications. And what new companies can be enabled by this that, that maybe couldn't exist five years ago or wouldn't have been as big? Yeah, so um, 
uh, I think that there are new companies like popping up all the time around just like, like on the privacy angle, for example, like understanding what consumer data you have and how you're using it. Um, and even where it's located, like for compliance reasons, like that is uh, a big opportunity. Um, we were lucky enough to be investors in this company called um, App Dynamics in the APM space, um, application performance monitoring. And it's like the basic thesis of App Dynamics was you have more apps that are important to businesses, like performance is going to matter more. So we can build a big company here, like trying to understand modern apps. And so um, I'm an investor in a company called Screen. Uh, which like kind of rhymes with app dynamics. You have more apps that are more important to businesses, like securing them is going to be more and more important. And the ways that you used to secure applications, like they don't work in 2019 when you have CI, CD, and you can't like have something sitting in some sort of test cycle for test and security cycle for a year and a half before you actually deploy it. Yeah. Like consumers won't accept that. H how much of your investing in general is sort of, um, Hey, I'm observing the market and I think this should exist, X should exist, and I'm gonna look for X or all the companies doing X first. I'm gonna look at what's taking off and boom, that, that, that's the most interesting thing. Yeah, so, um, so in the last year, Greylock has written checks as small as like $50,000 on the seed side and as large as $50 million as like a first check into, the, into a company. So um, the, the range is pretty broad. That being said, like our sweet spot is like series A investing mostly. Uh, like be the first institutional partner that's sitting on the board for a company for a very long time, um, uh, or the Series B, and like we really have that just because we're like, oh, like you know, having two shots on goal is great. Right. Um, uh, and if we think about like how much of it, how much of it is like thesis driven versus like um, just meeting meeting great entrepreneurs. Um, every investor at Greylock varies. Um, I am probably. Uh, I'm, I'm probably like half and half, yeah. where I'm like hunting, like I believe this thing should exist, and I don't know what the exact shape is, but I'm right. gonna like meet people until I find somebody building the amazing thing. Um, uh, and then 50% is just like, I have general interest in the area. Yeah. Um, the, uh, and the, the, we actually, you know, at Greylock, we think about the different stages as like, no product, initial signs of product market fit, Mm -hmm. um, like initial signs of like go to market scale. Um, and as investors, we'll, in, we'll invest both like, if there's no product, obviously you are only thesis driven, yep. right? And there it helps to be sort of proactive and to have like spent a bunch of time in a space and thought about it deeply because it gives you the conviction and be like, have eight or 10 or $12 million even though there's nothing there yet yeah. or the very beginnings of Signal um, versus if it's an area that you haven't spend that much time in, like then actually having the data of adoption yeah. makes it a lot easier. Right. right? So th let's actually talk about fundraising tips for, for companies that are at those three stages respectively. Yeah. Um, so uh, in companies that you see at the first one, which is uh, all, all these are driven for you, you know, they're very early. What, what is sort of separates companies who, who do a great job uh, pitching at that stage versus companies who only do a good job or okay job? Yeah. Um, like what will get you really excited about? I actually, um, uh, I, I think at that stage, you, you have to believe in the thesis and the, the way like an investor, um, would I, the way I understand it is like, what's the story for the yep. company, right? Because um, a startup, until you have like real product in market making money at scale, is a story that's told again and again to like yourself as the entrepreneur and like your first hires and your investors and your customers. And if you're really good at articulating like that story and why it matters and why you're unique in your category, um, then like you're gonna have a much easier time with all of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I actually think like just those two pieces, like why does fixing this problem matter? And like why are you unique in the category of like alternatives to fix this problem like those are just the two fundamental right. questions right um, and then uh, on the other on the other hand like if you don't have products like we're just investing in the team um, I'd say like Greylock has a bunch of and I personally I work with a bunch of first-time entrepreneurs yeah. and repeat entrepreneurs um, uh, the like so it, it's it's really not all about pedigree um, and, and I think the the things that I look for personally that might be different from other investors would be like, I really want to see, not like, um, 
not like uh, growth, at, uh, growth at all costs, like just aggression, but ambition. I think yeah. it's quite different from that, um, just because we have a billion dollar fund. Um, I'm actually super optimistic about software in general. I think there are like many, many ways to make yep. money in software, but the only ways that are relevant for Greylock are the ones that like are big enough to change an industry, yeah. basically. Um, and how should entrepreneurs think about the differences between an investor pitch and a, and a customer pitch, how, however subtle they, they may be? Um, I actually think that, uh, um, like I, I actually ask people for what the customer pitch yeah. is, and then uh, the, the second follow-up question is just like, and what are your ambitions that you think like, that are sort of secret to you, yeah. right? Um, like the ones that your customers don't know about yet because they're not quite relevant because people think you're crazy because like it would freak out your partners because it's competitive to like 18 other things. Like you usually have like some like strategy secret yeah. that you, um, sometimes you tell customers because you're like, here's the promised land. Like yeah. this is the little piece we have, like the first 10 or 15%, right. but like here's where we're trying to get to. And I think like entrepreneurs who are really good at selling that vision yeah. um, can be really successful. But I also think that sometimes like the bigger your vision is, the less friendly it is to the ecosystem often. Right. Um, and like claiming it when you don't have success in the first piece right. with customers and with partners is like unnecessary sometimes, right? So like one, one phrase we have internally at Greylock is like, why do companies stay in stealth if they're, um, like if you can sell to customers successfully uh, and, um, and make good progress, then sometimes there's no need to like poke the beast, right? Yeah. Like tell all your competitors like you're out to get them when they're multi-billion dollar companies and you're you. Right. Um, that can be that can be a weapon too, but I, I think like probably just like the scope of what you share, but the ambition, the ambition like you should share with your investor because right. like hopefully they're there for five or ten years and Do you want to be aligned. Are you more of a fan of companies staying stealth than than current than currently is? Or? Um, I I just think it it depends. I think like if you have a if you're serving like uh, large enterprises and you have access to um, those companies as customers. Uh, and like you, you're just in the phase of like iterating with them and making sure that they're successful in getting the first version of the product right, or you can even like make good traction without yeah. going and putting a lot into like a public presence and PR and product marketing. Then like don't go spend money on that yet and don't poke the beast. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I think on the other hand, if you are um, if you're like a bottoms up SaaS company and you're serving like. SMBs or trying to get adoption from individual end users, like the only way to do that efficiently is to do it digitally, right? So you kind of have to be open from the beginning. It doesn't mean you can't gate it, right? So we have this portfolio company called Figma that had a long beta. Um, and like, I don't think people remember that like two years ago even, like it wasn't clear that Figma was a great replacement product yeah. for other things you might use as a designer because it, it's just a big product. It took a long time to complete. Um, so I think, but they weren't in stealth. They were just like, right. we're in beta. We are working on it. And yeah. we're gonna have maybe tens and hundreds of thousands of users in beta. Um, but uh, you know, we just want people to understand we're still working on it. I feel like Robinhood also had a, had a long beta, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, and you know, exclusivity as a yeah. dynamic also can be an interesting driver for companies depending on what your sort of product brand is, right? Superhuman's a great example of this. Yeah, you, you mentioned that you do both repeat entrepreneurs and first-time entrepreneurs, but there is this sort of trope that people are more, investors more sympathetic towards first-time entrepreneurs and consumer, maybe because they're close, they're typically younger, they're closer to the consumer than, than an enterprise which requires um, you know, expertise or, or network, or how do you think about um, first-time entrepreneurs in, in enterprise? And, and what do you typically advise them to? Yeah, well, to about half them? the people I work with are that. Um, so, uh, I'd say like there's more, um, there is probably more domain knowledge that's a requirement to like serve the large enterprise, right? Um, and I think one of the reasons where it's unlikely that you get a, for example, like 21 year old like person just graduating college serving a high end enterprise is they don't, they won't have the life experience they may be an extraordinary entrepreneur, technologist, product person, like recruiter, whatever. Um, uh, example, um, Dylan at Figma, yeah. right? Now more than 21, but not that much more. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and, but he didn't start like building an enterprise product. Yeah. It happens to serve enterprises now. Uh, but if you, if you think about like, if you were gonna build a, um, 
modern like CRM, right? Like go after Salesforce or something. Like, uh, what interaction do you have with like the world of enterprise sales if you're 21? Um, very few people have had that experience. Um, so I, I think that uh, I, I think like both on the domain of like if you haven't been in the workforce for a significant number yeah. of years, like you just don't run into the problems that people are trying to solve at work, yeah. right? And so like I think there's like just empathy for the user um, and like understanding how organizations work. Uh, if you're a great product person, you can go learn it, right? And so like people just go and they're like I, they get really obsessed with problems and they can research them. And um, so some of the founders I, I work with look like that. Um, on the other hand, I think the other pieces of domain, I kind of care less about, um, but I can see how investors would be concerned, and, and that's like, uh, how do you, I, I think that's really on the sort of go to market yeah. uh, and organization building side. The organization building is common to consumer and enterprise. Like, how do you become a mature leader, right. even if you're a first time entrepreneur? Um, and like startup leadership is different from you know big company leadership yeah. or nonprofit leadership or whatever people have done before. Um, but the domain of like how do you do go to market as a as an art and science like I actually think that's it's not simple but it is something that is more common to companies. And yeah. so at Greylock, I think the reason we're like not concerned is not the right word, but like ready to address it or take that risk on is we're like, oh, cool, we can help with that. Yeah. Right. Maybe you'll innovate 10, 20, 30 percent on it. Right. But like the playbook has been written. Like, let's go try and apply it and see what fits. Yeah. And we'll get to that, that playbook in a bit. Uh, staying on this founder path for a second. How do you think about uh, uh, sales teams that have like a sales driven founder that has that isn't technical mm. versus a technical founder that can't sell or technical founding team that has no not can't sell it's no experience selling yeah um experience is only like one component yeah. of it right like i think like proof that you can do something is great because then there's no question right um but it just because you haven't done sales doesn't mean you won't be good at it right right or you won't learn it um, or just because you've never officially had a product title yep. um, doesn't mean that you can't be a person with great product instinct, right? Yeah. And you can't like have an appreciation for that or be really like user and customer centric. Right. So we look for different signals that a CEO is like, if, if they come from an engineering um, or a product perspective that they're very customer centric yeah. and that um, separate from that, they're like commercial, right? Yeah. They like wanna build a big business that grows yeah. revenue profitably. Um, and, and so it's it's really less about the experience and more about like the decisions they make and their ability to hire around themselves like people who do have some of that experience. Yeah, going back to Figma for a second, you mentioned how it started serving consumers and then it moved to enterprise. We also have a company, Kapwing. Have you ever seen Kapwing? It's an yes. online meme editor uh, tool that also started um, serving consumers and that noticed a big opportunity in enterprise. Yeah. What is your sort of advice for for companies that could sort of you know, go go either or how, how they should think about whether to, to move to enterprise quicker and, and maybe broadly you can get into your, your thoughts on sort of the consumerization of enterprise trend and how companies should think about this. Yeah, so I, I'd say, um, I think, I, I actually think about it from the use case perspective, right? So Figma, Figma will always serve people at work, yep. right? I mean, they probably, s they did start with like designers who are like, oh, I'll like try this for my side project instead of like for the core thing I'm building at work. But it's a, it's a professional tool. So it's not necessarily like consumers. I think the thing that, um, the thing that they did do is say, okay, this has business value. Yeah. If I, if I 85% use Figma to do things that are valuable for a business, um, from an agency to like a Fortune 500, then I should charge the business for yeah. it, right? Um, I, I don't, I'm trying to think of, like we had another company in our portfolio called um, OpenDNS that actually started with like a pure consumer security angle hmm. and then turned into an enterprise security business um, and just use like security conscious nerds like me or other people in you know, IT and security at big companies uh, as an adoption vector in the enterprise. Um, but I, I would just be clear, like if, if the use case is business value, then like figuring out the complexity of um, how you get somebody to adopt. Is that an end user? Is it like a department head or manager? Is it centralized like in um, like, you know, IT or something like that? Um, figuring out what your adoption vector is 
um, uh, is, is probably the hard part, not the fact that the business should pay for business value. Right, and uh, let's go deeper into either the open DNS example or Figma example or any other c example of company that's exploring uh, either path. Right, what is there, there the are companies that have both right. values, right. right? So like, uh, you know, we were investors in Quip. People use Quip personally, yep. they use it at work. Um, uh, we're not investors in Zoom, but I love Zoom and like, I'm thinking about getting a Zoom room in my house. Like, I'm yeah. probably a weird consumer, <laughs> but like, <laughs> Video is great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and should there, uh, what are the, how do you recommend, should they, should a company like Zoom do both from the get-go? Should it be a sequencing, staging? How, how should companies think about? I would like, you know, hesitate to offer any value yeah. to Eric since he's done great <laughs> with his yeah. business. Um, but I think they, they kind of did what I described, which is like, uh, they, because replacing, you know, WebEx or some like, super expensive enterprise telepresence system that people had invested millions of dollars in as part of some enterprise like level license agreement with Cisco or Microsoft or something like that was going to be a hard push so yeah. he said like I'm going to start by giving end users a product that is free um, and just show it's better right. um, uh, and like keep working on that and eventually um, once there's proof that it's a much better product, like yeah. I'm, I'm massively oversimplifying, like you know, a decade of work, right. but um, on both the product and the go-to-market side. But um, that gives me like the data I need to go actually win uh, like big replacement deals. Right. Um, and so I, I think like if you if you have a product that's built for that kind of adoption, it can it can forge a different path for go-to-market in in the displacement markets that are really hard to break into. Yeah, and let's go back to the, the three different stages of fundraising you, men you mentioned, or companies that, that come into you. One was sort of basically pre-product, the other was, wh how did you phrase the other two? Was it pre-product Initial market? product market fit. Right, so yeah. talk more about what, what that looks like for you. Yeah, um, I, I think it, it really... And when people mistake that they have product market fit, they don't even realize that they have initial product market fit. Yeah, um, uh, actually I, I gave a presentation to a, um, like a big company product team as a favor around like, uh, product management in enterprise startups as being different from product management in like most other scenarios. Um, and so, like one of the base premises is that you don't, um, uh, it's really easy to get false data on product market fit actually. Because uh, especially if you sell to um, customers in Silicon Valley for example and you ask, like b until you ask for a check, if you ask like does this idea make sense to you? Does it help? Like do you like the thing? Like, they're mostly gonna nod and say yes, right? They're gonna, because people, people, especially in our community, they're fundamentally nice, right? They're interested in new technologies. That's not a real signal. Um, and, and so a lot of what uh, I think like we try to be more sophisticated about is like, how do you get great data and engagement from your customers? And I, I think like there are ways to do that with higher and higher fidelity without having the product fully done, right? Because yeah. like, if you're an enterprise product, you, you have to get to like, a pretty rich MVP to actually be useful to the enterprise, right? So you don't yeah. want to be like waiting for product market fit signal until right. you're fully done with the first version of the product. Um, and so I, I think like, you know, a part of this is um, like product marketing, but it's, it's easier and easier to go to everything from like the tools of um, uh, the, the data sheet or the press release. Um, so Amazon has this practice of like, okay, when you release the product, uh, what is the press release about it that's customer yeah. facing, right? Like, how do you define it? How do you deploy it? What's the business value? How much does it cost? Um, uh, and what are the use cases that you, like with like successful customers that you wanna be able to talk about? That's a very clarifying exercise. Um, and then if you show people that data sheet, then they have something to react to that's not like, I have this fuzzy idea. Um, and so there's tools like that. There's like, just build people mocks before you of, of like the UI and the end-to-end -end workflow of like, oh, here's when you would think to use the product, here's how you use it. Um, uh, and, and so this is, I, I think this is like just core product management, but, um, but doing, it, doing it and trying to like front load that data gathering is really useful to young yeah. companies who are like, I have 12 months of runway, right? Um, and then I think the other, the other question that I just like really think companies should um, get into is like create the business case, right? Um, which starts with like, how do you think I should price this? Or um, here's how I'm thinking about pricing it. I think that's not a really uh, natural question for a lot of entrepreneurs to ask, but it's a really important question to know the answer to. 
Um, and uh, and like if you are solving a problem, then there is a business case for it, which is like you're saving me time. Okay, yeah. how much time? Whose time? Right? Or you're you're making this pain go away. How would you value that? Like, do you want it on this kind of volume? Do you want it per seat? Like, who would you have to ask for and budget for? Because I, I think what the one challenge I see with like really young companies is. Um, they talk to a bunch of friendly customers and they think they're building something that is really valuable, but then they get to the point where the project is mostly built and like they don't have as much time to change the course of the ship um, and they haven't asked that question. Yeah. And like if they're missing even 20% of like the product that they need to have, then it becomes very difficult to sell. Yeah. And can you say more about what, uh, what, you see, what mistakes you see uh, founders make around, around pricing or how, how they should make sure to be thinking about it? Um, it, it's probably a stereotypical thing to say that most people um, start by pricing too low. Um, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know if I necessarily like strongly believe that for your first handful of customers, but I, I think that um, uh, one just tactical thing is even. Uh, giving people an understanding that you're still experimenting with pricing or giving yourself room to move on pricing, right? Um, and so an example would be like for your first five customers, like one way to test pricing would be to say, here's what I think we're gonna price the product at. You know, you are important customer partner to me, number three, and so we're gonna give you this massive 50% discount on it, right? Um, but if you don't set that up for yourself and then you try to raise prices later, it just becomes a lot more challenging, right? And it, it gives you both data points of like, I'm super friendly to the customer, but, uh, um, but I understand whether or not they think like, oh, eventually I'm gonna have to renew, is it actually yeah. worth X, Y, Z? Um, I think uh, another, another just problem that people face on uh, pricing is the, like a smart customer is going to think about like, What's the, how do I, um, just how do I budget for this, right? I have to go find the budget for whatever I'm buying. And, and so, um, like, sometimes people don't understand the volume of whatever they are pricing on, right? So if you price on API calls, if you price on number of Amazon instances, if you price on number of people, if you price on, like, volume of business spend on a corporate card, like, sometimes people don't know the answer to that, right? So, like, it's very scary if, uh, the pricing is not obvious to the customer because then they can't be like, mm, $20,000, cool, I can make that happen. Um, and I, I think one, one other just sort of, um, I think a mistake is, a, is a, again too strong, but adjustment that people go through is if you, if you serve multiple segments, figuring out how to, uh, like, how to do that on your public website and with your sales force is complicated. Yeah, so I wanna ask you a few questions around go to market and uh, get your advice there. I may be starting off with how should uh, companies think, or what do you think about the differences between the approach for enterprise, mid-market, and SMB? Yeah, um, I don't have a lot of religion around this. I, I think there are some uh, investors who are like, okay, large enterprise is most efficient. That's who buys like most of the software and the IT and the security today. Um, that is true that that's where most of the spend is today. I think that uh, because software has become more and more accessible online and cheaper to deliver, like Amazon, SaaS, this is great, um, we're gonna see more and more companies that actually serve the SMB and the mid-market or different individual audiences really successfully. Um, I think that science of like how to get to a specific audience with a bottoms up or a, a straight to mid-market motion um, is less developed. Yeah. So people have been doing like field sales for Oracle for a really long time, right? But the idea of like a digitally driven funnel that you know sells to developers that then you upsell like Atlassian, um, like that's a newish thing. Um, but I, I think like as a, as a collective group, the startup community is learning a lot about that. Yep, and what advice do you tend to have for uh, entrepreneurs in terms of finding their <coughs> First early customers, first pilots, what, what mistakes do you see them make either in finding them or in working with them from yeah. the get-go? Um, I, I, I think about a couple different dimensions. Uh, there's, um, there's, like, is the, there's engagement. Like, are they actually gonna work with you? Um, if you are uh, building a business product, like, 
unless you have an exact replica of that business in your own company, unlikely, like you need to understand yeah. how it's being used somewhere else. And so one is just like, how are they gonna help me drive the right product? Um, the, the second would probably be like, are there more of these people and is that the segment that I actually wanna serve, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so I think sometimes people, um, they're not as careful as they should be about selecting the use cases and the, the segments of the, custom, uh, of the customer base that you know, it's, it's really easy to extrapolate and be like, okay, we're just gonna, um, our first target customer segment is mid-market regional banks. I know how many of them there are, and it's like I think, you know, at this pricing, like there's a real business there or not. This is like a very clear um, segmentation based on like my first initial customer. Um, I think another, another one is just referenceability right, and how much, they, how much pain they have, actually, which is related to it. Um, because if you, like, you know, problems are gonna apply more severely to some than others, you wanna serve people with a great amount of pain because they're more likely to then go be advocates for you, and you really need that early. Yeah, and how about as they scale? You, you'll notice none of those were, like, the biggest revenue, right? Yeah. Just because it, it's so, it's just really not indicative of, like, what the next 10 years of the company looks like. And what, what's your advice from going beyond that that are trying to find their sort of scalable customer acquisition channel? Um, are there examples of companies you've seen that have done this in a really interesting way that others should, should model? Or, or what advice do you have for, for entrepreneurs who are you know, really focused on nailing that? Yeah, I, um, I'd say some of, uh, no, there's, there's a significant portion of enterprise like SaaS and IT and security that sold through getting, um, getting like external field reps to become productive at scale and giving them enough pipeline to continue to be productive, right? I, I think you know if that's the name of your if that's the name of the game that you're playing, go to market. Like you don't need to necessarily invent lots of new things, um, but I, I think that there are like more and more. Um, I, I think the complexity there is often figuring out like what your playbook is, like what those, what what's the like set of things in what order that those reps are doing, and how they describe your product to their customer, and just how to manage that process in a really disciplined way, and how to hire the right people. Right, those are some of the core challenges in a traditional enterprise go to market. Um, if you are trying to do something where um, you're like more digitally driven at the extreme, you're like consumer self-serve or like a business user self-serve or something that's inside sales um, over the phone, then, uh, then I think like it's, it's actually some of the same, uh, for inside sales, it's some of the same considerations. It's just like a less mature set of practices. Yeah. Um, and then on the marketing side, I, I think like, you know, people are constantly creative here. <coughs> Right, um, because you can, you know, like content marketing wasn't as much of a thing for businesses 10 years ago, but now it is, mm -hmm. right? Um, or um, what's old is new again. Apparently, like outdoor billboards work really well selling <laughs> stuff to startups <laughs> in Silicon Valley. Um, I'm only half joking, but um, like we see in SaaS com companies that like do really well um, with performance marketing on Instagram, right? Like. I didn't know if that was a thing five years ago. I think likely not, but uh, I actually think that there's gonna be more of a discipline around, um, you know, it, it's traditionally called demand generation, but like enterprise growth, right? Figuring out all of the advantage ways that you can reach your customers in a way when like there are just many more digital and real life ways yeah. to reach them. Uh, what else do you wish uh, companies really understood about go to market or, or what misconceptions do you think people have about go to market regardless of life cycle of the, the company? Um, uh, so I, I was, uh, I was an en I've been an investor longer than any of these things, but I was an engineer, and then a product person, and then a product marketing person, right? So I think like product marketing is where it's at. Um, but if you think about what that is, that's the story you tell to customers. And I, I, I just think that people don't, um, they don't focus enough on like getting this right because um, when you when you actually have the right story like here's the category of product here's how to understand it here are the use cases here's how you measure value um, uh, and here's why it's worth like X dollars like then um, then the rest of it is more mechanical um, and so you can like you can do all the demand generation in the world and hire great reps but if like the positioning isn't right 
and the customer isn't like consistently nodding when you tell that story, then you have a problem, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I, I think like that's probably the area where companies um, miss the most, and I think that's more of the like art in it. Cool. I want to end with a few questions around uh, mistakes that the founders make in, in different segments, and then I want to open it up for, for, for Q&A. Um, so going back to, to sales for a second, what, what mistakes do you think uh, entrepreneurs typically make er early on when thinking about building their sales organization or, or sales pro uh, processes that you you wish wish they knew? Oh, I think for both, like, um, I actually think that this misconception has like gone away a little bit in uh, in startup land. But um, you used to have a lot of engineering oriented founders that would be like, uh, like, ew, we don't need sales. Right? Um, if we build it, they will come. Uh, like, I think like that's mostly not true. Um, and like, one way to this is just just to reframe this in people's minds is like, you need to help your customer find you and consume you. Right? Like, that can be sales. It can be a lot of other. It can be traditional sales. It can be a lot of other creative things. But like, that feels like an important thing for the company to do. Um, uh, um, but but I think another sort of misconception that turns into a mistake is thinking that both like product and go to market are not, um, like you can't have discipline around them. You can have operational discipline around all of these things, right? Like the best, uh, and, and so like the old view or the, the misconception might be um, like, oh, like just hire a bunch of sales guys to go like eat steak dinner with customers. And like, don't get me wrong, like, you know, people, people from, Enterprise sales at Oracle for 10 years know certain things that are probably very useful to enterprise startups. Um, and personal relationships and relationship building in social settings is sure super important. But um, but the very best like product and sales leaders that I know in young companies, like they have a ton of discipline, right? They like they collect data about customer reactions in a really programmatic way. Um, and go-to-market leaders are the same, where they're like, okay, well, here, you know, here's how we understand our funnel in a really granular way, um, and here's what's working, and here's what's not. Here are the five attributes of a rep we hire who's going to get productive in the next eight weeks. Here's like the five qualifying questions we ask a customer, and um, that makes them a good fit for us. And if we, if they say yes to all these things, and then we put them through a demo, and then somebody goes and visits them, and then you have a meeting with like three stakeholders in the room, we're 80% likely to close that deal, right? That is a like a much better feeling for an entrepreneur to have when their sales leader says like, I know how this system works, right? So I, I, I guess um, I, I think a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs don't really necessarily believe or drive toward having like a scalable system, and it's, it's really hard at the beginning when you yeah. have like one to five salespeople, um, but uh, great companies, like they just get repeatable. Everyone please give a round of applause to Sarah Grove. Thank you so much for joining us.